Well, today is a pleasure to have again Kathy with me and this uh, conversation about markets, about train following, all these things that are always, uh, I'm feeling passionate about these topics all the time. So thank you, Kathy, for your time. I hope I'm you... happy to be with you. Yeah. So the first question I have for you is for the people that still don't know you. I know you very well. I, I, I've been following your career for, for a couple of years, but the people that know you, could you please walk us through your background a little bit that people understand where you are right now? Well, like you, I'm a CMT, so that's Chartered Market Technician, and my discipline is technical analysis, and, and it's really, I'm, I'm very much a purist in that sense, not, not really because I don't agree that there's other forms of analysis that are very beneficial, but because it's always been my expertise in sort of the early stages of my career, which really began in college. So I went to University of Richmond in Virginia, and we were fortunate enough to have coursework in technical analysis. And then I also picked up an internship there with Dorsey Wright. So I'm sure you've heard of Tom Dorsey. He was really yes. inspirational uh, for me early um, in my career, and I, I kind of set, got set on that path with, with that sort of option to have a mentor at that age and also to have you know, the, the academic side of things as well. So I, I really got on the track very early on, started my career in San Francisco, and uh, eventually ended up on Wall Street, was a publishing sort of sell-side research analyst. And ultimately, uh, my last place that I sat was at BTIG in New York City. And from there, I, I launched Fair Lead Strategies, which is my own firm, and it's an independent research provider of, of technical analysis. So we, we uh, provide research to individuals and institutions, and uh, we cover primarily U.S. equities, but we really uh, cover anything that has a price. Uh, we can have an opinion on that. So we have cryptocurrency research. We do a lot of what we consider to be macro technical, so looking at crude oil prices and treasury yields and you name it. And then we've also recently launched an ETF. So it's called the Fairly Tactical Sector ETF, and that's brand new as of last week. Yes, and this is my second question. How <laughs> difficult or easy, I don't know, because I haven't done this before, how difficult must be to launch your own ETF? Can you walk us through that process a little bit? Oh, goodness. I mean, it, it was a long time coming, <laughs> a labor of love up until this point. <laughs> um, it, I mean, it really started with um, the idea, right? The idea of, of taking the work that we do, this the technical analysis, which we approach pretty systematically, and turning that into something that's a working model or system. And uh, that's something that really developed almost uh, organically. It wasn't with the intention of developing an ETF in the early stages. It was to fa facilitate some work that we were doing with some clients. Uh, but we took our methodology and isolated it into a series of rules and filters and ultimately built over the, over the course of a couple of years uh, a model that we felt really had very good probabilities and, and was a very good uh, reflection of the way we approach the markets. And, and we, of course, then applied that to different markets. And uh, we really believe that sector rotation is the key to outperforming the U.S. equity market. So, so that's where our focus is for this ETF. And we couldn't have done it without a partner. We have a great partner who is essentially doing everything but the portfolio management and the marketing that we do. So um, thankfully, they've taken a lot of the burden off of us at Fairlead Strategies in terms of um, the back end that is really very onerous as it pertains to an ETF. There's a lot of paperwork, let's put it that way. So yes. uh, to, to, <laughs> I can't to see, it, yes. <laughs> to see it, it finally hit the tape and uh, start trading, it was it was not only exciting, but also meant that the paperwork had largely been completed. So it was a really big relief for me to get to that stage. So this ETF, what I'm reading right now, is based on three elements. is trend following, price momentum and sector relative strength. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say it's really, it incorporates both momentum indicators, trend following gauges and overbought oversold measures. And we do have a filter also that applies essentially to that sector relative strength or ro rotation piece. 
And uh, the primary goal of using those tools is to isolate prevailing trends and momentum, of course, on the sector level and have that US equity exposure. This is large cap exposure because we're focused on the S&P 500 here. And with that, we want to make sure that we're in the sectors that are working the best. And, and it's, uh, you know, trying to identify those and filter out the ones that have a lower probability of outperforming the S&P. Okay. And it's uh, based on more large cap? Is uh, mostly focused on large cap? It's essentially a fund of funds. So it is all okay. large cap and that it only has S&P 500 exposure. Okay. We invest in actually our investable universe for TAC is actually 14 other ETFs. So we have of those 11 are the sector spider funds, if you're familiar with them. Yes. Uh, the tickers are maybe XLF or XLK, XLI, et cetera. <laughs> And each of those represents one of the major 11 economic sectors. And we take the filters, apply it to those sectors. And then we also have a risk off piece. So there's three ETFs that we're considering for inclusion for that risk off piece. They represent short-term treasuries, long-term treasuries and gold. So we have that ability when not enough sectors are, are checking the boxes, so to speak, yep. uh, we're, we have the ability to move into more risk off asset classes. Okay. And the ticker, just remind us the ticker name, but the people that... It's, so it's TAC, so T-A-C-K. And of course, there's a saline reference in there, as with fair lead <laughs> strategies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so and, it, and it makes sense. I mean, what we're, we are trying to do is navigate volatility, and yet it is long-term in focus, and that our real goal is to not avoid pullbacks, but to avoid major drawdowns. So we, we don't want to be exposed highly, at least during market downdrafts using those sectors as our proxies for it. Okay. Okay. So do you have a couple of charts that you can share with, with us? Uh, I don't know. Let's take a look to maybe S&P 500. That's the most common one. And, or... The other one that everyone is talking about is, of course, the, okay. Um, Let's start here. This Hopefully you can see this. I know that the yeah, I can see it. screen yes. is a little bit busy. <laughs> yeah, I can see it. I can see okay, it. Okay, good. This is a monthly bar chart of the S&P 500. And uh, it really tells the big picture. And it's something that we always keep in mind when we're um, providing a bias from a short or intermediate term perspective. And it shows several indicators that we hold sort of near and dear to our hearts. And, and we've just sort of developed this methodology over the, the 25 years that we've been doing this, in part just working for great mentors who had tools that uh, they, they helped us learn and understand how to best use them. So the, what you're seeing here is sort of a collection of tools that comprise our methodology. The bar chart itself, you can see a nice uptrend. And yet, uh, within that context, there has been a loss of long-term upside momentum. And the indicators that we use, like this stochastic oscillator here and this MACD indicator here, they do reflect that loss of long-term upside momentum. And it's something that we want to be really mindful of. And, and you know, with a, a market that does have weakened momentum, then it just becomes harder. It becomes harder for the market to forge higher in the way that it did last year. Uh, of course, that was an unusually strong year. Um, but also it, it tells us that perhaps we need to become a bit more short to intermediate term uh, with our long exposure, uh, or else we'll be living through periodic corrective phases that really are damaging to uh, our portfolios. And of course, we felt that in Q1 of this year, it doesn't look like terribly uh, damaging when you see it on the monthly, but it was a rough couple of months. And with that pullback or, or corrective phase, whatever you want to label it, we have a downturn or reaction to overbought readings from a long-term perspective. And that downturn is a setback that, that still is with the market. So we, we have this sort of overhang uh, that we think will influence the market probably into Q4 of this year based on the nature of these indicators. And with that in mind, we're still very willing to, to trade, to kind of um, take the various swings in terms of short-term moves to the upside and downside and try to take advantage of those. Uh, but this is our context. You also see on uh, the price bars, there's some numbers floating above them. Those are the DeMarc indicators. 
and DeMarc indicators, there's many of them, but the ones that we're using here are designed to understand when a trend might be exhausting itself, at least in the near term. And we had some sell signals that arose based on this model late last year, and they reminded us of late 2017. And we, of course, saw in 2018 more of a trading range environment with a big Q1 correction, a mid-year relief rally, and another Q4 correction of about 20 for, uh, 20 percent for the S&P 500. And I wouldn't rule out similar price action this year. As it stands within this sort of a context, we have room for a greater relief rally by my measures, even to, to the fact that um, the S&P 500 is poised to reach a new high, but perhaps not stay there for very long. So we'll be really sensitive to any down ticks on an intermediate term basis because of exactly what you see here, which are downturns on a long term basis. Okay, okay. And to you, we're gonna compare this one with, I don't know, there's, I mean, some people are being correlating S&P 500 versus uh, Bitcoin, for instance. So what, do you see any relationship on that? There is, you know, it's funny when, when you take the, um, the correlations and run them Bitcoin versus the S&P 500, um, it has definitely tightened up that correlation over time. You can take it going back to last year where it was fairly low and it increases with the shorter time horizons. And, and I think that's a function of this being a very sort of top down oriented market. You can blame that on macro concerns. You can blame that on geopolitical issues, unfortunately. And I think when that happens, when we have these kind of global issues, uh, they tend to make the correlations higher just across all risk assets. And we do consider Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to be a risk asset. So with these tighter correlations, uh, you know, we can get some information from that, but we never really want to rely on it for our investing. We can get take some cues, um, but the, the correlations do at times break up and, and they can break up dramatically so. So we're not going to use that as an investment sort of input necessarily, except to say that, okay, well, it's kind of interesting to note that Bitcoin is trading a bit more like a high growth stock than it ever has. And we'll be respectful of that here in the near term, but it's not something that we would rely upon uh, really beyond the very near term. So we, we have seen that indeed. And of course, Bitcoin has seen a good relief rally, just like the S&P 500 from a short term perspective. Uh, you can see here, though, Bitcoin shares the same loss of long term upside momentum. That's in the monthly MACD for Bitcoin. Um, it's not uh, too damaged here on the stochastic oscillator, which have, has actually turned up. So it's possible that the uh, you know uh, trend for Bitcoin is actually more sideways, like we think it might be for the S and P five hundred. But you can see within that context, we have some pretty wide swings in each direction. So uh, we're going to concern yep. ourselves with those swings and try to take advantage of them just from a short to intermediate term perspective. Okay. And you also are following one specific commodity based on what's going on with the commodity rise in the last couple of years. So is there any you think is more room to still going <laughs> in that direction? Or Oh, yeah. I mean... <laughs> It's amazing. Um, the move has been really impressive and, and yes. it is a long term turnaround that we have seen just broadly in the commodity complex. And um, let's see if this works here. I'm trying to pull up the crude oil chart from a long term perspective. We'll, we'll keep it long term here just because yeah, 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 yeah. The, the short term can be sort of dizzy in these days, right? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Very noisy. too. <laughs> so, so we have this uh, you know, a proper uptrend. You can just see this in the 12 month moving average, even for uh, for crude oil prices. And then, yeah, we do have what was a prolonged overbought reading here. And that overbought reading now has given way to a downturn. So we think it, you know, crude oil is likely to struggle here. Uh, it, it has some resistance between about 110 and about 115 if you go way back. But I always think when you have to go that far back for resistance, sometimes it, it, it's not as meaningful uh, because maybe the market's memory isn't that long. Um, but needless to say that that downturn from a long term perspective in terms of the overbought reading, it, it also creates a challenge for this uptrend. 
uh, but not necessarily beyond the next few months. So the next few months, we think we're going to see a lot of backing and filling. And by that, we mean uh, it's kind of choppiness, um, but within the context of what is still positive long-term momentum behind crude oil, and, and that can carry over to a lot of commodities. Uh, so we, we're looking for that trends to persist, and yet um, near term or well over the next few months or so, I think a lot of backing and filling is likely as perhaps these recent moves are, are somewhat digested or perhaps the trends, I, I don't know how you want to say it, but maybe are normalized uh, after such a sharp up move in so many commodities. Okay. And the last one I'm going to ask you for today is the, the, the yields. So what do you think about 10 years? The 10 well, years is, it is being also in everyone's mind and everyone's talking about it too, because there are some changes based on also what happened with the Fed increasing interest rates, see how it's going to impact these uh, particular assets. Yeah, it's so interesting right now. I think, um, so this is the, the 10 year treasury yield going way back, um, yes. which is back to the late 80s. Um, if you can ignore the cloud because it's a bit um, out, of, out of sync with that, but notice we have lower highs over time, right? Um, yes. Now, this, this rally, which really began um, at the COVID low in March 2020, this up move has taken it above a series of sort of interim resistance levels within this downtrend channel that you can see here. Uh, the upper boundary, of that downtrend channel, and we've been talking about this for a long time, is about 255, so 2.55% for 10 year treasury yields. And of course, that's not too far gone from current levels. So uh, we're at this kind of critical juncture in terms of resistance. It also happens to be a Fibonacci retracement level. If we were to see um, treasury yields climb above that decisively, so we, we hit that recently, if we see a breakout above, then it effectively reverses this multi decade downtrend channel. And it puts next resistance at the 2018 high, which is about right here, about three and a quarter. Um, so it really is at this in, uh, sort of important juncture. We think before we see a breakout, we do think we will see a breakout and that's based in part on this momentum here. Uh, but before we see a breakout, we are looking for consolidation. So our bias now is sort of neutral to lower based on some indications that we have on the daily and the weekly bar charts that we track. Uh, but you can see that, you know, with just very incremental upside follow through and yields that we have a pretty major reversal at hand. It doesn't mean it goes straight up from there, uh, but certainly does suggest that three and a quarter, maybe not this year, but maybe next year becomes a relevant level. Okay. Well, Kathy, I really appreciate your time today. I really enjoy always, you know, talking to you about the markets, your analysis, the last thing I'm going to ask is, how's your Spanish? Is do you? Oh, <laughs> <how's>... terrible! <laughs> <laughs> so the next time that we meet up again, the conversation it has to be in Spanish. So I. Oh my goodness! <laughs> well, I'm going to get my Google Translate ready. <laughs> Thanks, Juan. I appreciate the time today. Yeah.